You may have heard the expression, knowledge is power. Well, today we're going to give you more power to control your diet and lifestyle by giving you the facts. Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. You can't help but marvel at the constellation of new consumer choices in the dairy and meat aisle, helping to innovate us out of this precarious situation with regards to pandemic threats posed by animal agriculture. Today we're going to look at the personal human effects of plant-based meats, and we start with the environmental assessment of 50 different plant-based meats, showing them to be vastly more sustainable. There is increasing consensus that transitioning towards reduced meat consumption and more plant-based diets is a key feature to address important health and sustainability challenges facing humanity. According to the United Nations, we would have to double the production of meat and dairy to meet the predicted demand for animal proteins in 2050, when in fact we'd have to do the exact opposite if we were to contain the ecological damage. Nearly every credible forecast shows that if we were to have any chance of meeting future food in a sustainable fashion, lowering our meat consumption will be absolutely essential. While more centralized governments may be effective in influencing consumption patterns, uh, since the main drivers of global meat consumption are things like rising incomes, urbanization, and Western culture, I mean, the main identified drivers of meat demand are difficult to influence through direct policy intervention. Thus, we have to take our case directly to the consumer. But you know, information and education may not be enough. Uh, we may need the increased availability of ready-made plant-based products. Too often, ethics and sustainability alone does not stand much of a chance in a world of consumers. Many consumers seem deaf to ethical arguments, which may be quickly forgotten when it comes down to buying food. When it comes to consumer-perceived barriers to following a plant-based diet, the largest barrier may simply be meat appreciation. People enjoy the taste of meat. So in practice, if we want people to shift over to plant-based options, the taste, structure, and nutritional value of vegetarian meals could be developed to more closely follow the preferences of meat eaters. I mean, no point in designing a veggie burger for vegetarians. right? They're already not eating meat. right? So when you know, Pat Brown founded Impossible Foods, his goal was to create something a burger lover would say is better than any burger they've ever had, oh, or the Beyond Burger created by Beyond Meat, a company founded to tackle climate change by creating plant-based products that were juicy, meaty, and delicious. But how much better are they for the climate? Both the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger have had environmental life cycle assessments published by reputable groups. I did a little piece for the Swiss investment firm UBS summarizing the results, and indeed, switching to either drops greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and water footprints down about 90%. Uh, similar analyses have been done on more than 50 different plant-based meats. All such studies found them to be vastly more sustainable, with no real differences in greenhouse gas emissions uh, observed between the kind of different sources of protein they use, whether it's wheat or soy or whatever, though obviously any products containing egg binders would be significantly worse. Now, of course, if you went straight to the unprocessed peas and soybeans from which the Beyond and Impossible Burgers are made, you could not just get a 90% lower impact, but like a 99% lower impact. But that impact drops to zero if no one is willing to eat it. A review on consumer research of meat substitutes found that although things like health and environment can persuade consumers to try a meat substitute, it's the appearance and taste that are crucial factors for their consumption on a regular basis. Interestingly these days, though, plant-based foods may actually have a leg up uh, if you give college students actual animal-based chocolate milk, mac and cheese, chicken tenders, and meatballs, but lie to them and tell them they're actually made from plants. Surprisingly and unexpectedly, the researchers found that when subjects tasted the food and rated how much they liked the taste, those who were told the food was vegan liked the food significantly better than those who were told the truth. I mean, just thinking a food was vegan actually increased liking for the taste of the food. Well, other demographics may have a different reaction, though, in which case there's always sustainability by stealth, using blended products that substitute out some of the animal protein for 
plant protein. In the last year, such hybrid products have made a promising entrance, so much so that major meat producers, Purdue, Tyson, are bragging about the incorporation of plant protein into their blended products. In our next story, we look at what happens when you compare the trans fats, saturated fat, sodium, and cholesterol levels in plant-based versus animal-based burgers. Global meat production has skyrocketed over the last half century, uh, with pork and poultry meat now exceeding 100 megatons a year, 100 million tons, and this growing demand is unsustainable. The reduction of animal products is arguably one of the most impactful ways in which individual consumers can alter their diets to positively impact individual and societal well-being. And there's a definitely growing interest in plant-based diets and meat reduction, but even just something like meatless Mondays requires dietary change, and sadly, neither sustainability or health approaches are likely to work with those who love their meat. But swapping in plant-based meat substitutes may help, help kind of disrupt the negativity about reducing meat, but for hardcore meat eaters, it's got to taste like it and look like it. It's interesting, the more people consume meat substitutes, the less likely they are to care that it has a similar taste, texture, appearance, or smell of meat. But to appeal to those who really need them, right, the meatier, the better. Uh, this has certainly been accomplished with the spate of new products on the market, with all studies agreeing that they're healthier for the planet, but what about healthier for us? Comparing labels of the burgers and looking at four of the worst components of the food supply, trans fats, saturated fats, sodium, and cholesterol, the plant-based burgers win hands down when it comes to trans fat and cholesterol. Uh, we all know trans fats is a serious potential risk factor for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes, but it's also been recently associated with symptoms of depression, lower testosterone in men, even just at like 1% of calories, and dementia. Higher levels of trans fats in the blood is associated with up to a 50% higher risk of developing dementia, including Alzheimer's. Uh, now that partially hydrogenated oils have been phased out of the food supply, the only major source of trans fats left will be from animal products. What's the tolerable upper daily intake level for trans fats? An upper limit was not set for trans fat by the Institute of Medicine because any incremental increase in trans fat intake increases the risk of heart disease, the number one killer of men and women, as in any intake above zero. Uh, because trans fatty acids are unavoidable in diets that contain meat or dairy, consuming zero trans fat would require significant changes in patterns of dietary intake. Uh, one of the authors of the report from Harvard's Nutrition Department offered a memorable explanation for why the Institute of Medicine panel didn't you know, cap it at zero. We can't tell people to stop eating all meat and all dairy products. He said, well, we could tell people to become vegetarians, he added. If we were truly basing this only on science, we would, but it is a bit extreme. Wouldn't want scientists to base anything on science now, would we? No. But anyways, that's a big advantage. And of course, no hormones, no antibiotics, hasn't been you know, designated as probably cancer-causing by the World Health Organization, and on and on. Now, I'm not happy with the added salt, which is about a quarter of the American Heart Association's 1,500 uh, milligram uh, daily upper sodium limit, or the saturated fat, uh, thanks to added coconut oil, um, but uh, these do seem to be outliers. I mean, in the largest study of the nutritional value of plant-based meats to date, saturated fat levels of similar products only average about 2 grams per serving, much better than the animal-based equivalents. Right? Sodium remains a problem throughout the sector, though, like nearly any other processed food out there. How processed are these products? Well, I mean, if you look at the fiber content, for example, yes, I mean, to see any fiber in a burger, that's a good thing, but I mean, compare that to a whole food, right? If you ate the same amount of protein from yellow peas, for example, the primary plant protein in Beyond Burgers, uh, there'd be almost no saturated fat in sodium and a whopping 20 grams of fiber. So yes, you know, processing plants in a processing plant can eliminate 90% of the fiber, but processing plants through animals eliminates 100% of the fiber. 
Um, so, of course, as the chair of Harvard's nutrition department put it, you know, nutrition policies and dietary guidelines should continue to emphasize a diet rich in whole plant foods, such as nuts, seeds, and legumes, or pulses, which are rich in protein and many other nutrients, uh, but require little industrial processing. But we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Not everyone can go all you know, kale and quinoa overnight. It's a no-brainer. Finally today, what are the different impacts of plant protein versus animal protein? And do the benefits of plant protein translate to plant protein isolates? So are these plant-based burgers healthy or not? Right? And the answer is, compared to what? I mean, eating is kind of a zero-sum game. right? Every food has an opportunity cost. I mean, every time we put something in our mouth, right, it's a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in our mouth. So if you want to know if something is healthy, you have to compare it to what you'd be eating instead. So, uh, for example, are eggs healthy right? Uh, compared to breakfast link sausage? Yes, uh, but compared to oatmeal? Not even close, right? I mean, but look, I mean, sausage is considered a group one carcinogen. In other words, we know consumption of processed meat causes cancer. Each 50 gram serving a day, uh, that's uh, the, like a single breakfast link, was linked to an 18% higher risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, so the risk of getting colorectal cancer, eating one link a day, is about the same as the increased risk of lung cancer you'd get breathing secondhand smoke all day, living with a smoking spouse. So, uh, compared to sausage, eggs are healthy, but compared to oatmeal, eggs are not. So when it comes to Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, yeah, they may be better in that they have you know, less saturated fat, but hey, you want less saturated fat? And plant-based meat alternatives are no match for unprocessed plant foods such as beans or lentils. A bean burrito, lentil soup, could certainly you know, fill the same culinary niche as a lunchtime burger, but if you are going to have some kind of burger, I mean, it's easy to argue that the plant-based versions are healthier. Right? There is a sodium issue, and it's not that much, if any, lower in saturated fat, since they use coconut oil, which is basically just as bad as animal fat. Uh, there's not much advantage on that front. Though the total protein is similar across the board, does this matter? Or is there any advantage to eating plant protein over animal protein? Let's look at the association between animal and plant protein intake and mortality. In the twin Harvard cohorts, following more than 100,000 men and women over decades, after adjusting for other dietary and lifestyle factors, animal protein intake was associated with a higher risk of uh, mortality, particularly dying from cardiovascular disease, whereas higher plant protein intake was associated with a lower all-cause mortality, meaning a lower risk of dying from all causes put together. So replacing animal protein of various origins with plant protein was associated with lower mortality, especially if you're replacing processed meat and egg protein, which were the worst. Uh, but when it comes to living a longer life, plant protein sources beat out each and every animal protein source, uh, not just better than bacon and eggs, but better than burgers, chicken, turkey, fish, and dairy protein. Together with other studies, these findings support the importance of protein sources for the long-term health outcomes, and suggest plants constitute a preferred protein source compared to animal foods. Why? Well, I mean, unlike animal protein, plant protein has not been associated with increased levels of the cancer-promoting growth hormone IGF-1, for example. Now, uh, soy protein is similar enough to animal protein that at high enough doses, like eating two Impossible Burgers a day, you may bump your IGF-1. But the only reason we care about IGF-1 is cancer risk, and if anything, higher soy intake is associated with a decreased risk of cancer. Uh, for example, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis found that soy protein intake was associated with a decreased risk in breast cancer mortality. We're talking a 12% reduction in breast cancer death associated with each 5 gram a day increase in soy protein intake. Uh, but the high soy groups in these studies were on the order of you know, more than 16 grams a day, associated with a whopping 62% lower risk of dying from breast cancer. Uh, more than 10 grams of soy protein a day may be good, associated with cutting breast cancer mortality risk nearly in half, and getting more than 16 grams a day may be better, which is like one impossible burger a day, but we simply don't know what happens at consumption levels far above that. Plant protein has also been linked to lower blood pressure, uh, reduced LDL cholesterol, and improved insulin sensitivity. No wonder 
Substitution of plant protein for animal protein has been related to a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Indeed, 21 different studies following nearly a half million people in high animal protein intakes were associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes, where even just you know, moderate plant protein intake was associated with a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. Okay, but these were just observational studies. They all tried to you know, control for other dietary and lifestyle factors, but you can't prove cause and effect until you put it to the test. The effect of replacing animal protein with plant protein on blood sugar control in diabetes, a systematic review, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, even just switching out about a third of your protein from animal to plant sources, yielded significant improvements in long-term blood sugar control and fasting, blood sugars and insulin. You can do the same thing looking at cholesterol. Systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials on the effect of plant protein on blood fats. And indeed, swapping in plant protein for animal protein decreases LDL cholesterol. And this benefit occurs whether you start out at high cholesterol or low cholesterol, whether you're swapping out dairy or meat and eggs, and uh, whether you're swapping in soy or other plant proteins. I, I mean, we've known about the beneficial effects on soy and cholesterol going back nearly 40 years, but you know, other sources of plant protein can do it as well. Yeah, but we're not swapping beans for beef. I mean, these products are mostly just isolated plant proteins, mostly you know, pea protein isolate in the case of uh, Beyond, and concentrated soy protein in the case of Impossible. Right? If you just isolate out the plant proteins themselves, are you still going to get benefits? Yes, surprisingly. Interestingly, the researchers concluded that they did not find a significant difference between protein isolate products and whole food sources, suggesting that the cholesterol-lowering effects are, at least in part, attributable to the plant protein itself rather than just the associated nutrients. And so it's not just because you know, plant protein travels with fiber or less saturated fat. Plant proteins break down into a different distribution of amino acids. So it's like if you give people arginine, an amino acid found more in plant foods, that alone can bring down people's cholesterol. And even plant protein concentrates used in these products aren't pure protein, uh, retaining a few active compounds such as phytosterols and antioxidants, which also can have beneficial effects. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may share it on our social media to help inspire others. To see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. For a vital, timely text on the pathogens that cause pandemics, you can order the ebook, audiobook, or hard copy of my book, How to Survive a Pandemic. For recipes, check out my new How Not to Diet cookbook. It's beautifully designed with more than 100 recipes for delicious and nutritious meals. And all proceeds I receive from all my books go to charity. NutritionFacts.org is a nonprofit science-based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest in nutrition research via bite-sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There's no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence-based nutrition.